In the last episode of Small Council Transitions, we were left with only Varys as Master of Whispers and Grand Maester Pycelle at the time of the Mad King's death, with one character's well-being left unknown. A new king has the right to replace past members of the Small Council to fit his political views or even just have more characters he likes around him for advising. And Robert won the crown through a rebellion. He didn't succeed it as intended by the Targaryen's custom. The presence of men who previously served the Mad King in the same room with the easily angered King Robert could have been problematic. But Robert decided to not only let Varys and Pycelle keep their heads, but even let them keep their very high profile jobs. As far as positions go, it doesn't get much higher than these seven advisors. Pycelle actually helped out Robert in the war without him noticing. The Lannisters were neutral for the majority of the year the fighting took place, but when the Mad King needed Tywin most, he showed up outside King's Landing's gates. It was Pycelle who convinced the Mad King that Tywin was on his side when he really wasn't. With that reassurance from the educated Grand Maester, the gates were opened. The Lannisters sacked and took the capital for the injured robber. It only became clear many years later that Pycelle had a huge Tywin bias. But Robert didn't have much of a choice in the matter. The position of Grand Maester is decided by the most educated man at the Citadel, unlike some of the other positions. They are sworn to serve the realm generally until their death. But the Citadel's highest authorities can take back their decision if things get ugly in King's Landing. Varys, on the other hand, could have gotten the boot, and it's honestly surprising he didn't. He was so irrationally loyal to the Mad King to the bitter end. I think the fact that he was a foreigner from Essos saved him. It made it appear like he was just doing what his job entailed wasn't truly loyal to the Mad King, as well as being so damn good at his craft of spying and gathering intel, he isn't so easily replaced. Behind the scenes, Varys was actively preparing for Robert to be a terrible ruler. The spymaster had a deeper interest in the politics of Westeros than anyone could have predicted. It's believed he faked Rhaegar Targaryen's only son's death and shipped him to Essos for safekeeping. Aegon VI was being prepped for rule, if this does turn out to be true. Varys' schemes are all over the place though. Things at court needed to be quickly mended for Robert's seat to be secure. Five empty seats were on the small council. Even the king's guard was left barren after the smoke cleared. The easy choice was appointing a hand of the king. Robert already returned the favor to the Lannisters by marrying Cersei and keeping Jaime on the king's guard when Ned Stark advised him to send him to the wall for breaking his oath and kingsling. Giving Tywin anything more like a seat on the small council would be asking for too much, especially since Robert and the Mad King's former hand Tywin were not acquainted with each other. The position of Hand went to Lord John Arryn, Robert and Ned's foster father, a powerful noble who rules over an entire kingdom, the Vale. It's surprising that Ned wasn't asked to take on one of the other vacant seats though, but he and Robert did just recently get into their first big fight over the killing of Rhaegar's children under Tywin's orders. Ned also just had a newborn baby that he had yet to meet, so I'm sure he was more than happy that Robert and John didn't offer him anything. Like with Tywin doing all the real legislative work for the Mad King, Jon Arryn did everything for the 21-year-old King Robert. Sir Barristan Selmy was a famous hero and Robert respected nothing more than skill and strength on the battlefield. When Barristan was injured in the war, it was Robert that sent his own maester to care for his injuries. When it came time to decide what to do with Barristan, Robert offered him the newly opened position of Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Sir Gerald Hightower, his predecessor, was recently killed by Ned Stark and his men. Barristan wasn't jumping for joy or anything. He didn't care for either Robert or the Mad King for all their flaws. There just wasn't many other options out there for him to go serve. He lost all of his other brothers and was only left with Jaime who disgusted him for being a Kingslayer. House Valerion historically served Targaryens as master of ships. It wasn't officially hereditary or anything, but pretty close to that. Robert, or likely John Arryn, decided that there was no way a Valerion was going to serve this new corps with their deep ties to House Targaryen. 19-year-old Stannis Baratheon was already tasked with building a new royal fleet for Robert at the end of the rebellion, so he just got the job as master of ships. The Baratheons are not known to be great sailors or anything. I think master of laws fits Stannis' skill set best with his deep sense of justice. Robert wouldn't know that though. The brothers didn't like each other much, and Robert spent a lot of his days in the Vale growing up. Robert's selection of master of laws is tricky to explain. We know that Renly Baratheon eventually got the job, but he was only 6 at the time of Robert's succession. They would have to wait at least 10 years before baby brother was suitable, if a 16 year old brain can ever be considered suitable. But nepotism was in full effect here. There's three possible options George Martin can take this unnecessary bit of lore. Either the seat was vacant and John Aaron served as both hand and master of laws, or some yet to be named character was likely a lord to the job. 
Last and least likely is the Mad King's former is the Mad King's former master of laws continued on to Robert's reign. That guy was Lord Simon Staunton. He was so minor of a character, even the supplementary books didn't bother telling us whether he made it out of the rebellion alive or not. He was up there with the most loyal servants of the Mad King. He came from a minor house in the Crown Lands, so thought ass kissing could ride him all the way to the top. With a reputation like that, no way Robert was going to keep him around. He might have even taken some land from his family and redistributed it to houses that fought on his side as a form of punishment, which Robert did do for some others. A new master of coin was also needed to handle all the crown's gold, debt, and taxes. The last guy was burned to death by the Mad King after speaking out against his insane plot of blowing up the capital with wildfire. It doesn't appear like anyone was given this seat for six years. Robert took a prosperous realm with a full treasury, so John Arryn could handle things at first. But after a while, the new king began to show his true colors, and John needed an aid. Robert was so demanding and financially irresponsible that they bankrupted the crown just so he could drink and party with everyone around him. Costly attorneys and banquets were too much for John Arryn to handle. His much younger wife, Lady Lysa Tully, had a suggestion. Bring in the guy handling one of the Vale's port's customs and tariffs since he was excelling. Enter Peter Baelish, aka Littlefinger, who accidentally permanently seduced Lysa when they were younger living in the Tully's home. Accidentally because he drunkenly thought he was sleeping with her sister, Catelyn, when in truth it was Lysa in the bed. The book says it was John who called her Littlefinger, but it's obvious it was Lysa's doing, with her always trying to get closer and closer to Peter. Though Peter's achievements in Gulltown's port couldn't be ignored by John Arryn, the city's the fourth largest in all of Westeros, and he still was able to bring in ten times more money for the port. He only worked under John at court at first, before he was appointed to Master of Coin. Wouldn't want to rush giving such an important job to such a minor lord. It took three years in King's Landing until he was promoted. John Arryn was naive, maybe even more than Ned. First, he advised Robert to let all the Lannisters and their ambition flood the capital. Now this. Peter, with his newly found power and influence, went to work quietly destroying the realm so he could rise higher after its fall. He slowly began to attack the realm from within by making complex loans for all of Robert's childish spending habits. The debts the crown owned were becoming serious, especially considering the Iron Bank's power. But with the Seven Kingdoms united, things still seemed okay, so Peter changed that. John Arryn and Lysa had a young son that the Hand wanted to foster a way to Stannis Baratheon. The unstable Lysa would not let her son go, so was easily convinced to kill her own husband. Peter provided the poison and set the Starks up to fight the Lannisters. With all this chaos, he could start making bigger moves. And that was the first and only dead character for the members of Robert's small council. John Arryn's sudden death was passed off as an illness by Grand Maester Pycelle. A new hand would be needed to run the realm while Robert did little to nothing. Robert selected his next closest family member to him, foster brother Ned Stark, to replace their foster father. They had made up since the whole murder of Rhaegar's children situation, but a similar scenario arose within the small council thanks to Varys. One of his spies across the sea was Sir Jorah Mormont, an exiled former northerner. Jorah was keeping an eye on Viserys and Daenerys for King Robert, whose hatred for the Targaryens hadn't died down since the rebellion. Robert's reaction to Danny marrying Khal Drogo and being impregnated by him was to assassinate her. So Varys seems to be fully invested in Rhaegar's son that he hid away and willing to kill off Rhaegar's little sister. Ned attempts to quit his new position, but Robert orders him to stay at court. After John Arryn's death, Stannis never returned to King's Landing. He'd been mysteriously absent from the small council, and all Renly was concerned about was having Robert put aside Queen Cersei or his best pal's sister, Marjorie Tyrell. Yeah, before Renly married Marjorie, he wanted Robert to take her. Stannis knew the truth about what did John in, since he was the one that shared the breaking news. All of Robert and Cersei's children were fathered by Jaime Lannister. Stannis had no plans to return to court to await a similar fate. Ned, during his snooping around in King's Landing, openly snooping with no precaution that is, began to suspect Pycelle had been working for Cersei. All it took was one letter from Crazy Lysa to set Ned off in the Lannister's direction. Ned was close, but it wasn't Cersei Pycelle was loyal to, it was mainly Tywin. Without even a word of instruction, the Grand Maester would do what he believed would benefit the Lannisters, even if it meant treason. He knew Jon Arryn was poisoned, but let him die, he even confessed to his willingness to let King Robert slowly bleed out from his hunting accident, though he didn't need to, because the boar cut him that good. Robert never got the chance to realize how corrupted his small council was. It was everyone but Stannis, Barrison, and Ned who were scheming behind the scenes. Stannis actually made sure to stay away from all the dramatic politics. He knew accusing Cersei and Jaime of treason would make it seem like he was just trying to take away Joffrey's inheritance. 
Robert's reign lasted 15 years. 15 years of nasty shadow politics, taking advantage of a king who didn't even want to be king. I do want to make at least one more of these type of videos, but if y'all have requests for rulers, I'll happily make more. Makes this job a lot more fun and easier working on something I know people want to see. Thanks for watching this one.